Have natural history museums become irrelevant? Have their displays become so outdated and archaic that they are now misleading the public? Have museum curators consciously withheld certain fossils from their public displays? Fossils that would place the theory of evolution in jeopardy? Or do they not have the financial resources to update their museums? This man has raised these questions and asks for you to decide the answers. Hello my friends, welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman, it's my privilege to be your host. Did modern animals live alongside dinosaurs as the theory of creation suggests? Or did dinosaurs only live with strange and unusual plants and animals as the theory of evolution says? Have natural history museums misled our children and the public at large in how they display dinosaur life? Our guest today, has raised these questions and has provided an exciting new way to look at the past. Dr. Warner is the author of the popular book series, Evolution, the Grand Experiment, which includes Volume 1, The Quest for an Answer, and Volume 2, Living Fossils. Dr. Warner is also the executive television producer of the highly acclaimed video series, Evolution, the Grand Experiment which is played on eight television networks worldwide. Dr. Warner, it's such a pleasure to have you here with us on Origin. Thank you, Don. It's great to be back. Now, today we're going to talk about your second DVD called Living Fossils. Why did you make that video? Well, as you know, Don, there are serious problems for the natural explanations of how the universe came about, how life began, and how evolution could have occurred with the fossil record. I'd like to go over some of those with you. The first problem with the natural explanations for the origin of the universe deals with the origin of matter. Scientists cannot come up with a solution how matter could have created itself naturally to create the universe. In, in other words, the universe has 10 to the 21st stars, each star billions and billions of metric tons of materials, yet they don't know how you would go from nothingness to the materials to make the stars. And the reason is there's a law of physics that says that matter is not created from nothingness. It's only transformed from one form to the other. There's no answers for that. So you have to get something out of nothing, and physics says that can't happen. Impossible, according exactly. to physics. The second nagging problem is that scientists cannot come up with a scenario how life could have began from chemicals in a primordial soup. And the reason is, is that in a primordial soup theoretical situation, the chemical elements, carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, do not form naturally to coalesce into these large macromolecules like DNA or proteins. And without DNA, you cannot start life. Or if you, you have to somehow get to DNA, they worked on it for 50 years and they cannot come up with a scenario how life could have ever begun naturally. So the debate never changes. You have to get something out of nothing and then you have to get life from non-life. That's right. And those are two huge things. And there's a third significant problem with the theory of evolution and that's the fossil record. I'd like to show you some of these fossils. That's exciting. The theory of evolution states that one animal changed into another. For example, a bacteria would have changed into a trilobite. Now that would have to be over multiple small steps over millions of years. Scientists have collected nearly one billion fossils so far, but they haven't come up with any ancestors for most or all of the bigger groups. For example,
trilobites. Most people are familiar with trilobites. They're very interesting. You can find them around your home. Scientists have collected 200,000 trilobites. That's a lot of trilobites. That's a lot of trilobites, and that reflects a tremendous fossil record. And yet, scientists cannot come up with an answer, where did trilobites come from? Now, the vertebrates are just as problematic. Sci no transitional force for trilobites, no transitional fossils for bats. No. And it goes on and on like this. The fossil record for fish. Museums have collected, believe it or not, 500,000 fossil fish. And you can see these are, many of these are full specimens. Now, with 500,000 fish being collected and nearly a billion fossils, most of those being invertebrates, you should see the steps going between an invertebrate and fish. Nothing. Scientists have no idea where fish came from. Didn't Darwin tell us that once the fossil record grew, we would see the transitions? Precisely. And he said, I can't see these transitions, but maybe, in, or he said, in the future, we'll see them as we collect more and more fossils. And here we are with a billion fossils and no transitions for any of these groups I'm showing you. Invertebrates. Over 750 million invertebrate fossils have been collected. That's a lot of fossils. We have perfectly uh, uh, developed and fossilized fossil um, crabs and, and starfish and crayfish, etc. But each of the invertebrate groups, the phyla, shows up suddenly without ancestors. Now that's very problematic to have such a rich fossil record of the end product and have none of the transition from a bacteria to a crab, a bacteria to a crinoid, etc. If evolution and the Big Bang and the origin of life don't work, what is the alternative? You know, the, as a scientist, I had to look at this and say, okay, if evolution doesn't work, then how would creation work? If creation occurred and it was a one-time creation, that would mean, in my logic, that all of the animals that have ever lived on the Earth one time cohabited together with the dinosaurs. But who has ever heard of a dinosaur being found with a modern species of mammal, plant, etc.? Who's ever heard of a possum being found with a dinosaur, or a duck being found with a dinosaur, or some other animal that we'd recognize as a modern version? And yet, my logic said, if evolution doesn't work, then I should be able to find modern animals at the dinosaur dig sites if, in fact, creation occurred. And this then became my test for evolution. So the test for creation is, if creation's true, you're going to see modern animals and dinosaurs in the same strata. That's right. Okay. And at the time I started this, after many, many years of reading and research, I knew of none. But I predicted I would find it. So, so how'd you go about doing this? Well, my wife and I, Debbie, and, and I went out and formed a television production company. And we simply went to the dinosaur dig sites. We went to 10 dinosaur dig sites in all. And we asked the question, have you found any modern species of mammals, plants, animals at your site? And we went to some of the most spectacular dinosaur dig sites around. We went to Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada, where 10,000 dinosaurs were buried together. We went to Dinosaur National Monument out in Vernal, Utah. We filmed out at Solnhof and Tal Quarry in Germany, where the famous Archaeopteryx was found. We filmed at Ghost Ranch, New Mexico, where a thousand Coelophysis dinosaurs had died at once. We went to Thermopolis, Wyoming, where 250,000 dinosaur bounds are buried in the ground. We went to the Iguanodon dinosaur site in Belgium, where a whole herd of Iguanodons were buried together in a coal mine. And we went to the Cleveland Lillard Quarry, famous quarry for paleontologists. We went to the Mygat Moore Quarry. We went to Petrified Forest, where they found early dinosaurs, Como Bluff, Wyoming. In all, we went to 10 dig sites asking the same question, wow. have you found any modern animals or plants with the dinosaurs? And the answer was always no. Dr. Warner, you're tenacious. You've been to all those main places around the world where dinosaur digs take place. And you know, I could have given up at that point, but I just don't trust uh, other scientists. That's just my nature. I'm a doubting Thomas. And I said, I just am going to press on and now look at more fossils. So my wife and I then started to go to the museums. See, the museums have the fossils that are pulled out of these dinosaur sites and they're on display. So we 
went around and started photographing fossils. Now, Debbie, I have to thank Debbie because she contributed to this project not only in emotional support, but her photography skills, her artistic skills. She went with me and said, let's go do it. The Great Barrier Reef, located several miles off the coast of northeastern Australia, is the world's largest reef system, stretching over 1,000 miles and is known for its corals and sponges. Dr. Werner dove here, looking for a match to a fossil coral he had seen at the Carnegie Museum. Before reaching his destination, this particular dive produced a treat. Dr. Werner was greeted by a giant four-foot hump-head Maori wrasse, who surprisingly performed a dance with this reef explorer. After this exhilarating encounter, his search continued for a modern coral to match this fossil exhibited at the Carnegie Museum. He eventually was successful. Although the fossil, with its round shape and mouth-like slit opening, was broken, the similarities between the living mushroom coral and the fossil were remarkable. But again, the dinosaur-era fossil was given a different genus and species name. Dr. Werner found fossilized examples of all of the major invertebrate groups, or phyla, living today in the dinosaur rock layers. The underwater photography was beautiful. Uh, how'd you get such great underwater footage? I mean, it looks like National Geographic. Well, it took some tenacity because we filmed underwater for 13 years on different trips, and it was a lot of trial and error. And ultimately, it came down to having the right equipment and the right techniques. We filmed most of those shots where the camera is only about a foot from the diver with a big wide angle lens and gave us these great spectacular video shots. Living Fossils is just one of four simultaneous experiments that I carried out to test evolution. It was based on a simple prediction that if evolution was not true and if animals did not change over time, I should be able to find modern appearing plants and modern appearing animals in the dinosaur rock layers. And this is in fact what I found. First I found a fossil shrimp in a dinosaur rock layer that looked very similar to a modern appearing gulf shrimp. Then I found a crayfish in a dinosaur layer that looked like a modern crayfish. Then a crab, then a prawn, then a lobster. Soon I realized I had found all of the major crustacean groups in the dinosaur rock layers. Then I turned my attention to the insects. First I found a modern appearing dragonfly that was found in a dinosaur rock layer. Then a katydid, then a cockroach, then a cricket, and soon I had representatives of all of the major insect groups living today from the dinosaur rock layers, and they looked the same. Then I had representatives of all the shellfish groups, the echinoderm groups, etc. And soon I realized that I had representatives of all of the major invertebrate phyla living today I had found these in the dinosaur rock layers and they looked the same. Next, I turned my attention to the vertebrates and here I ran into problems. Museums were, for the most part, not displaying the most important vertebrate fossils. They were kept out of the view of the public. So I turned to the literature and began interviewing scientists, asking if they had seen any modern appearing vertebrates with the dinosaurs and lo and behold they had. Dr. Clemens reported finding a modern appearing parrot in a dinosaur rock layer. Others reported finding ducks, loons, flamingos with dinosaurs. This was utterly amazing. 
and others reported finding shrew-like animals, squirrel-like animals, platypus-like mammals, and other mammals in the dinosaur rock layers. Now, I did not find any of the larger mammals in the dinosaur rock layers, but this could just as easily be explained by a misinterpretation of the geological layers, which I'll explain in the fourth video. Lastly, I turned my attention to the plants, and once again, I found representatives of all of the major plant divisions living today in the dinosaur rock layers, and they look the same. Sequoias with dinosaurs, oak trees with dinosaurs, magnolias, dogwoods, etc. It was, it was amazing. In summary, I predicted that if evolution was not true, I would find modern appearing plants and modern appearing animals in the dinosaur rock layers. And this is, in fact, what I found. Dr. Warner, that's an incredible clip with some incredibly important information. But let me make sure that I understand. You're telling me that in your research, you have found in every group of animals, you've found modern animals from every group of animals in the same strata with the dinosaurs. Is that right? That's right. We didn't find all of the animal, animals, but we found examples of every animal group or phyla in the, in the fossil layers, yes. So I guess the question is, when I go to the museum, why don't I see those animals displayed with the dinosaurs? Don, um, that is the million dollar question. You know, if you take your son or your daughter to the Natural History Museum, they look at the display of T-Rex and they see no modern animals. They see T-Rex, they see Triceratops, but they don't see a duck next to T-Rex, they don't see a flamingo next to T-Rex, and they don't see any modern plants or animals, et cetera, et cetera. And so the only message they could get from that is that life was different in the past. You see, by leaving out the modern animals, they have made a false pretense that life was different in the past. If you put the ducks next to the dinosaurs, the flamingo next to the dinosaur, the box turtle next to the dinosaur, the iguana next to the dinosaur, the hedgehog, the possum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you go back to that same museum, the, the dinosaur hasn't changed. Now you have the modern animals that were found with the dinosaurs next to it on display. Your son or daughter would say, gee, dad, that looks just like creation. All the animals were created at once and lived together. And so there is a problem how museums are displaying. And I'm frankly unnerved by what I've learned, you know, and how they're doing this. Dr. Warner, I may be a little more skeptical than you, but I, I, I need to ask you this. Uh, is the reason that those animals aren't there, are we being deliberately deceived? You know, my definition of science is the search for truth and the revealing of the truth that we find. Uh, when we find truth and we hide it in the back room, uh, is it because we're so committed to a theory that if the evidence doesn't fit the theory, we don't tell the truth? That's propaganda. Or are these scientists just so ingrained in evolution that they don't think it's significant? I'm not sure the answer, but um, I know that as a human being, if you believe one thing and you have evidence contrary to that, you don't want to look at the evidence. It may be the scientists know that flamingos were found with dinosaurs, but they just don't want to go out and do the work of collecting the fossil bringing it to the museum or a copy of the fossil and putting it on display because shoot it would be uncomfortable it would go against evolution so it may just be the human nature where you don't want to display things that go against what you believe could it be that in displaying it the questions are going to be asked they don't want to answer absolutely because once you put all these animals that live with the dinosaurs next to the dinosaurs all of a sudden there's going to be a question well, why, would, why do we even need evolution if all the animals were the same way back then? You know, as the host of Origins, I'm awfully, often accused of having my head in the sand and not being, look at, being willing to look at the facts. It seems to me that we Christians, we creationists, are the ones looking at the facts and that sometimes it's the other side that doesn't want to give an objective view of the evidence. Truth is truth. And, and I put a high value on truth, almost to my own detriment, you know, spending a lot of money, lots of time, but I want to know the truth. I do too. And the truth 
has revealed that evolution it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Folks, you've got to get a hold of this DVD. It, it's so well done. And the material that it presents is, is done in such a unique way and asks such basic questions that desperately need to be asked and answered. You, you just can't not order this. I want to urge you to get a hold of it. And Dr. Warner, there's not just a DVD, there's a book as well, isn't there? Yes, um, the book Living Fossils is a photographic essay by my wife and I, and it basically takes you through the evidence that I just presented. It shows you the f animals and plants from each animal phyla, each plant division, and on each page there's one fossil and one modern organism, so you can make the decision, is this the same animal or did evolution occur? And um, uh, I think there's over 700 photographs in this book. And it'd be hard to believe in evolution after you finish this book. It really would. You know, Dr. Warner, one of the things that I so deeply appreciate about your work is that you don't do anything that you can't do with excellence. And I want to say to our viewers that the photography uh, in the book is so well done. And the, the whole assembly, the whole presentation of the book is done with excellence. If you get this book, you're not going to be disappointed. You're going to love both the information and the quality with which it's done. And then how can we use this? We can use this not only for our own information, but it has teaching value as well, doesn't it? Right. The book is designed for either an adult to pick up and read it in a couple hours, or for a class to be taught on living fossils and evolution. And there's a teacher's manual that goes along with this. And it takes you step by step through the animal groups and talks about fossils, et cetera. And uh, it's very simple. If you don't know anything about science, you could still teach this course effectively. Wonderful. And uh, homeschoolers would want to pick this up especially, wouldn't they? Oh, um, there's a lot of homeschoolers already using the book. The video just came out. And the video is integrated into the program where you have the kids read a chapter from the book and then they watch the two-minute video segment and then go do their quiz. It's just very simple. You can do it at home, and it, it's effective. I want to say to you that as a, as a pastor, it's such a wonderful thing to have some books like this in the church library, that when our kids are, are t having to write papers on evolution for school, that they have a, another source of information rather than just the party line from the school. And when they present this kind of evidence, uh, they can get an A, and they can make the teacher have to rethink some of the stuff that's just being taught as, uh, as uh, absolute truth when only half the truth being presented. Yes. Dr. Warner, you've done a great service both for the Church of Jesus Christ and for the field of science by your investigation. Thank you for thinking outside the box. Thank you for wearing out several pairs of shoes going around the world and for the thoroughness and the quality of your research. Thank your wife for us for the tremendous job she does with photography. Uh, you've given us a great gift and we're very grateful. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, my friends, it's important for us as Christians to not ever be afraid to look at evidence because I believe the more we know about science, the more it will lead us to the God who made the heavens and the earth. And so I challenge you to get a hold of this material and look at it. Friends, we are not getting all the truth from the establishment today. And that means we have to do our homework. You have to listen to shows like this. You have to get a hold of tapes and books like this. And you have to pass it on to your children. And I believe that when you do all the study and you look at all the facts, you'll agree with me that it's God's view that he created you. And that should be your world view too. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I hope you'll think about what we talked about. And I pray you'll join us next time here on Origins. God bless you. watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1206, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148.
Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.